The second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. A rough week for the banking industry. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank marked the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. And just two days later, the collapse of Signature Bank marked the third. Now, with Credit Suisse on the verge of collapsing, there's been a lot of talk about what these bank failures mean for the stock market. Many people are basically assuming that the Fed needs to lower interest rates because they didn't know that raising them would tank bonds that were held by these banks. Let me explain why that probably won't happen and what this really means for your stocks. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. The latest inflation data just came in at the same time as the news of Credit Suisse collapsing, and now the Federal Reserve is caught between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, they've raised interest rates at the fastest pace in history to fight inflation, but inflation is still running hot. On the other hand, these same high interest rates are what's causing banks to collapse in the first place. So you're right to be asking questions like, can the Federal Reserve really afford to keep fighting inflation? And if they do, will the stock market be the next thing to crash? To answer that, let's dig into what actually happened without all the fear mongering. First off, let's talk about Credit Suisse, which is one of the largest 50 banks in the world and the second biggest bank in Switzerland. Credit Suisse has a long history of scandals, like going around regulations and sanctions, multiple cases of tax evasion, data leaks, and even banking for a Bulgarian drug smuggling ring that laundered money through them. So they're much closer to a Netflix crime drama than your typical bank. Credit Suisse's stock has been tumbling for years, and their biggest investors have been selling out for months. Just a couple days ago, Credit Suisse published its annual report for 2022, and in it, they identified quote-unquote material weaknesses in controls over their financial reporting. That's definitely not good news, but it's clear that Credit Suisse's problems didn't start this past week. On the other hand, before it collapsed, Silicon Valley Bank was the 16th biggest bank in the United States. Besides all failing in the same week, what Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Silvergate Bank all had in common is that they focused on serving businesses. Signature and Silvergate's biggest clients came from the crypto industry, while Silicon Valley Bank focused on tech companies and venture capitalists. These same areas of the stock market saw a massive run-up in 2020 and a massive pullback last year. Let's talk about the run-up first. When crypto and tech stocks were booming in 2020, these specialty banks saw way more deposits than they did in previous years. Silicon Valley Bank saw their assets triple in the span of two years, from $70 billion in 2020 to just about $210 billion. As a result, their stock price tripled, from their pre-pandemic price of $250 to around $750 when the stock market peaked. That sounds great, but with so much money in new deposits, Silicon Valley Bank found itself with a new challenge. See, banks make money by borrowing short and lending long. What that actually means is that a bank receives money when clients make deposits into checking and savings accounts, for which the bank pays clients a pretty low interest rate. Then the bank takes some of that money and loans it out or invests it. Then the bank keeps the difference between what it makes on those loans and investments and what it owes back to those depositors. Bonds and bank loans make up what's called the credit market, which is about three times bigger than the stock market and depends entirely on interest rates. When the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to, say, 4%, banks can pay more money on deposits to attract new clients. But that also means that they need to make more money on their loans and investments. Well, in 2020, as valuations for these Silicon Valley startups got richer and richer, they needed less high-interest loans from Silicon Valley Bank. So the bank invested more money into bonds. But in 2020, interest rates were still near 0%, so the yields on those bonds were fairly low. When the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, yields on new bonds rise, which makes prices fall for the bonds that these banks were already holding. That's not a huge problem if the bank can hold those bonds to maturity and collect all of the interest that they planned on. But rising interest rates also make it more expensive for high-growth startups to actually grow, which are Silicon Valley Bank's main clientele. Companies like Roku, Roblox, Ginkgo Bioworks, and several other stocks that I cover on this channel bank with SVB. Now these companies have lower valuations, which means they have a harder time raising capital, which means they'll need to withdraw money to cover expenses like payroll. They may even want to take on new loans. But thanks to some questionable investments and some poor risk management, Silicon Valley Bank didn't have enough cash on hand to cover all of these withdrawals, so it had to sell its older bonds at huge losses. When they announced that they needed to raise capital to cover the difference, everyone got spooked and tried to withdraw their money. That's what caused the run on Silicon Valley Bank. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
Don't our banks hold bonds too? So shouldn't we be worried about our deposits for those same reasons? Well, not exactly. See, bank accounts today are insured for up to $250,000 by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or FDIC. So if your account has less than a quarter million dollars in it, you're covered in case the bank fails. But Silicon Valley Bank catered mostly to companies with massive accounts. So a whopping 97% of the $175 billion that they had in deposits were uninsured. So these companies withdrew their money because doing so would cost them almost nothing. But not being able to access that money if the bank goes under could cost them everything. That's why insurance is so important. By the way, if you have anyone relying on your income, you need life insurance. It's that simple. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to get the insurance you need at the best price. Look, I get it. Life insurance is one of those things that no one wants to think about, but everybody needs. But if you get your life insurance through your job, it may not be enough to cover your family's needs, like mortgage payments, tuition costs, and other big expenses. And it won't follow you when you leave. So a good life insurance policy is really about getting the peace of mind that you deserve, which is why it was the first thing that I bought when I became a full-time investor. Policy Genius is disrupting the insurance industry with technology that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential to make sure that you get the best price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has no added fees and keeps your personal information private. No wonder they have thousands of five star reviews on Google and on Trustpilot. In today's crazy economy, your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find it. So head to policygenius.com slash ticker symbol you to get your free quote and see how much you can save. I'll leave that link for you in the description below as well. All right, so the sharp increase in interest rates caused bonds held by banks to lose a lot of their value. As a result, specialized banks like Silicon Valley, Silvergate, and Signature couldn't cover their large amounts of uninsured deposits. That's what caused the panic. Then, over the weekend, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the Treasury issued a joint statement that guaranteed all deposits at these banks. It's important to understand that this isn't a bailout for the banks, their executives, or their shareholders. It's a promise to the companies that deposited money in the bank the same way that you and I deposit money into our checking accounts and would need help if the bank couldn't give us our deposits back. The Federal Reserve also announced something called the Bank Term Funding Program, which offers up to one-year loans to banks so that they don't have to sell long-duration assets at huge losses to fulfill deposits. This financial backstop is what prevented a mass panic and restored confidence in the banking system earlier in the week. And just to be clear, there was a mass panic. Since SVB made their announcement, the iShares U.S. Regional Bank's ETF collapsed by almost 30%. Western Alliance, a regional bank headquartered in Arizona, crashed by around 66%. Same with First Republic, which many thought would be the next bank to fail. It's pretty clear that these banks, and dozens more like them, could have collapsed without government intervention. But the Fed may have just created an even bigger problem by insuring every single deposit. All of a sudden, many trillions of dollars are being covered for all these banks that are holding huge unrealized losses from the bonds that they bought before the Fed raised interest rates in the first place. Now, these same banks can get a loan based on the original value of those bonds, which basically lets them take more risks with their deposits, knowing that the government will backstop their losses if the investment goes bad. So if the bank wins, it keeps the profits. But if the bank loses, the Fed is there to bail them out. And how will the Fed do that? the same way they did when we all got bailed out during the pandemic. They'll either print more money, which means more inflation, or they'll lower interest rates, which also means more inflation. This is where the most recent inflation data comes into the picture. The consumer price index climbed 6% year over year in February, in line with expectations and down from 6.4% in January. But just like I say every month when I cover these numbers, we can't just pay attention to the headline CPI. The core CPI, which strips out food and fuel prices, climbed 0.5% month over month, compared to 0.4% in January. In fact, this is the fastest increase in core CPI since last September, and significantly higher than economists expected. Jobs data also came in strong, with 311,000 jobs created, compared to the 225,000 that were expected. 
These strong inflation and jobs numbers should support the Fed raising interest rates in next week's FOMC meeting. At least, that's what Jerome Powell said just last week when he testified in front of the Senate Banking Committee. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation is causing significant hardship, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Over the past year, we've taken forceful actions to tighten the stance of monetary policy. We have covered a lot of ground, and the full effects of our tightening so far are yet to be felt. Even so, we have more work to do. There is little sign of disinflation thus far in the category of core services excluding housing, a category that accounts for more than half of core consumer expenditures. To restore price stability, we'll need to see lower inflation in this sector, and there will very likely be some softening in the labor market conditions. With inflation well above our longer-run goal of 2 percent, and with the labor market remaining extremely tight, the FOMC has continued to tighten the stance of monetary policy, raising interest rates by 4.5 percentage points over the past year. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2 percent over time. Although inflation has been moderating in recent months, the process of getting inflation back down to 2 percent has a long way to go <clears throat> and is likely to be bumpy. As I mentioned, the latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than previously anticipated. If the totality of the data were to indicate <clears throat> that faster tightening is warranted, we'd be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. We will stay the course until the job is done. All right, now we've come full circle. The Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates at a breakneck pace for the last year in order to fight inflation. But inflation is still coming in hot and recent jobs reports are still coming in strong, which suggests that the Fed can keep raising interest rates. But here's what everybody's missing. In the case of Credit Suisse, scandal after scandal and a clear lack of governance around reporting their numbers has shaken investor confidence. And Silicon Valley Bank, Silvergate, and Signature Bank did a bad job of managing their own risk. These failed banks knew that interest rates were rising and bought these bonds and invested in other risky assets anyway. Nearly 10% of Silicon Valley Bank's balance sheet was in early stage and growth stage companies. So the only thing that might stop the Fed from raising rates is the risk of more bank failures. But that might not happen because most banks have much fewer uninsured deposits than Silicon Valley Bank had to begin with, since they serve more individuals and not just businesses. Also, most banks didn't triple their assets under management over the last two years, which is what forced Silicon Valley Bank to invest so aggressively in the first place. And most banks don't have such a big concentration of early stage and growth stage companies on their balance sheet. All of those factors contributed to Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. And when it comes to every other bank, the Federal Reserve just promised to help them operate with big losses on their balance sheets and help them guarantee all deposits. And we know that it worked, at least for now, since there haven't been more runs on regional banks. I think all this adds up to the Federal Reserve still raising rates at the next FOMC meeting. And again, that's what the market expected until just last week. And the Federal Reserve will keep implementing these band-aid policies to hold things together in the meantime. The risk of inflation sticking around is just too great for the Fed to ignore. But there's another huge disruption coming to the stock market that you need to know about. So make sure to check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. That lets me know to share more research like this. Either way, thanks for watching. And until next time, this is ticker symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.